Hey everybody, in this video we are going to talk about, just br briefly talk about genome-wide association studies, which have become very popular in this age of SNP genotyping. So we can use genome-wide association studies to gain insight into things that have been, uh, I guess, recalcitrant to um, genetic investigation. So most phenotypes in humans are extremely complex, you know, controlled by many genes. Uh, things like height and weight and IQ and athletic ability. You know, um, how do you even know? Uh, strength. So, so many, anything you can think about, you know, if there's a genetic component to it, it it's been essentially impossible to, to find the genetic basis of the, these things. Uh, and also very many genetic diseases, genetic disorders. If they're controlled by more than one locus, then they've been very, very difficult to, to get at the genetic basis of these things. Uh, diabetes, Parkinson's disease, uh, Alzheimer, Alzheimer's disease. Is it Alzheimer or Alzheimer's? I don't know. Uh, genetic basis of autism schizophrenia, heart disease, you know, all these things that, that are controlled by so many different genes, so many different genes are interacting to, to contribute to these diseases. It's been really hard to figure out the genetic basis of these things. And essentially genome-wide association studies are, are currently um, providing us with breakthroughs in these areas and uh, getting us a, a significant step closer to understanding things, uh, these, these complex phenotypes or, or complex genetic diseases. When I say complex, con being controlled by, by you know, several or many different genes in the human genome. And you know, I've never performed one of these studies. I do, I study fungi, I don't study human health. I don't, I mean, I don't research human health. Uh, so I'm just going to provide uh, a conceptual overview of how these things work. So essentially, let's say we wanted to study the genetic basis of height in humans. And what we could do is we could take, you know, we submit a grant to the National Institutes of Health and say we, we need some money, um, you, know, you know, give me a million dollars or whatever, or a hundred thousand dollars. And what we can do is we can take or find 1,000 volunteers, 1,000 individuals who are willing to participate in the study. And these 1,000 individuals should be, you know, very, very tall, but, you know, some like way above average height. And all we need to do is, you know, determine their SNP genotype for like a million SMPs, and this is very easy to do, very easy to do with the current technology that we just went over in the previous uh, um, video. So after that, well, then you need to do some statistical analysis. And essentially, uh, a common way to present genome-wide association study data, there's an acronym, for these studies, GWAS studies, so genome-wide association studies. Uh, technically, you'd say GWA study, right? Because the S stands for study, but you, you can say GWAS studies too. So, in a GWAS study, the data is typically presented with what's called a Manhattan plot, and it's called a Manhattan plot because once all the data is plotted, it can look like a skyline with a bunch of skyscrapers against the skyline. So with a Manhattan plot, the x-axis represents all the points on the human genome. And so let's say this area right here represents chromosome one, going from 
uh, the very first position, the first position to the last position on the chromosome. So they're really squeezed in here, right? They're really, really squeezed in. And this would be chromosome two, chromosome three, uh, chromosome four, And we have two alleles for each, each position, right? Because we have two chromosome ones, two chromosome twos, three and four. And somehow um, you use some statistics to correlate where that, where that point is going to go. But on the y-axis, you know, based on both uh, alleles. So on the y-axis over here, this is going to be the percent, uh, let's say, percent association of, let me see, what did I want to say this? Percent association of an SNP genotype with uh, the trait, whether it be a phenotype or a genetic disorder. And we'll have a line right here, a significance line. So if the point is below this line, it means that you know there's no significant association of that SNP genotype, whatever the genotype is. There's there's no whether it's the major allele or a minor allele. You know if it's below this line, then there's no significance of that SNP associated with the trait. So so it's likely SNP is likely near a part of the genome that's not involved with controlling height, and so most of the points are all going to be down here, and they're so squished in that even though the points are representing different SNPs along the chromosome, that essentially it looks like they're right on top of each other because you're squeezing all these points in here. And they're so close together, and there's so many points that it kind of looks like it's all filled in here. These are all individual points, and there's so many points that are not significant and not correlated with the trait that it kind of looks like, you know, doesn't they don't look like individual points. It looks like it's all filled in. And then up here, you might get some, you might start to see individual points up here. But for every chromosome, almost all the SNPs, very few are gonna be associated with this height, according to this data set. And then there are gonna be some points that are higher here, and we're gonna get sort of the, the skyscraper-like Manhattan plot view and I won't diagram all 23 chromosomes here in the sex chromosome, so I'll stop here. Um, again, so if you look in the notes, there are some, some copyrighted pictures in the notes and in our recommended textbook, you can get a better view of what one of these actual uh, uh, Manhattan plots looks like. An actual Manhattan plot from a study, I think on, on type two diabetes possibly. Uh, but, so, if the point is above this significance line, let's say right here in chromosome one, there are a bunch of points right here. Whoa, okay. That's pretty important. And let's say over here in chromosome five, there's another point with a bunch of SNPs that are, whoa, so above this significance line. And this is likely to be very complex. So there's likely to be other locations here. And let's say there are two positions on chromosome eight that are above the significance line. We have multiple SNPs, right? Because the SNPs are next to each other. So what this data is saying is that there's part of chromosome one and uh, part of chromosome five and part of chromosome eight here and another part of chromosome eight. There are genes in these locations that you know all have the same, or SNPs at these locations of the genome that all have the same genotype in tall people, and that's why those those SNPs are are above the significance line. So these SNPs are either in genes or near genes, or or this data suggests that those SNPs are in genes or near genes that control height in humans. And so there may be many of these. And so once scientists have this data, what they can do is go to these genomes here, go to the human reference genome, see where these SNPs are, see what genes are near them, and start to elucidate or, or investigate why these genes might be or how they might be working together to control um, height in humans. And so the same thing for genetic diseases, uh, schizophrenia, 
diabetes, Parkinson's. Uh, scientists can use this to find out, oh, okay, look, there are lots of genes and all these parts of the genome are somehow working together to cause this phenotype or cause this disease. Now let's look at these parts of the genome. Let's see what genes are there. And, and really let's get at, at the, the genetic basis of these things. Uh, so you can imagine if you didn't have this type of technology, well, how, how could you narrow down the parts of the genome that were you know, controlling the, these complex phenotypes or these complex diseases? You know, essentially, I, it, it's almost impossible, right? So that's why we've been studying these things for so long. But with new technology, oh, we're getting closer. We're getting closer to understanding these things. So very cool, very neat stuff. Um, I think we're going to bring this back a little bit when we start talking about uh, genetic engineering um, and uh, maybe designer babies in the future. Not that that's a good thing, but but that's where GWAS studies can come in and can play a role. Uh, there is a movie called Gattaca where, um, yeah, where you can kind of, I think it's like 20 years old, where they started predicting GWAS type data being used to to select um, children in the future. So uh, good thing, bad thing, uh, it's probably a bad thing, but uh, we'll talk about it and we'll learn how that process could work if it does occur. Um, okay, so in the notes, there's a question. What if you were doing a GWAS study of a trait that was controlled by a single locus, like albinism. Like we already know the gene that, that uh, when there's a mutation leads to albinism. But if you wanted to, and for fun, you could do a GWAS study and, and see what it looked like. Well, what you would see is that you'd see S SNPs uh, for only one locus in the genome above the significance line. And you'd be guaranteed that when you look at those SNPs, you'll see, you're, oh, they're near the gene that controls albinism. Yes, yes. So, so if you're studying a trait controlled by one gene with a GWAS study, well, if you're, if you're looking at your Manhattan plot, you should only see a cluster of SNPs at one location, uh, a cluster of SNPs above the significance line for one location in the genome. Okay, well, uh, brief introduction to GWAS studies. Uh, so just a conceptual look at how GWAS studies work. So I, I don't do GWAS studies myself, um, but uh, that's basically how they work. And uh, I think that's enough right now to uh, keep us moving forward in this course. So, okay, that's the last video for this lecture. We had quite a bit of, uh, I guess, the total length of the videos for this lecture is probably, you know, 50% longer than, than what we would have had in class alone. Uh, so I think the videos for the next lecture will be, will be shorter. So shorter than 75 minutes total. Okay, well, uh, I'll see you in the next videos. Mm -hmm.